Hello. Hope you're well. Welcome. And who cares? It is the beginning of my Christmas break. I don't have to go back to work until the first week of January. So I have a couple of weeks, almost three weeks, really, to uh, enjoy not going to work, which is a good thing that should be celebrated. And I plan on not doing much this Christmas season, just hanging out with family and hanging out with friends and just not going anywhere. So that also means I'm going to be doing some videos. And I already have, I think I'll probably spit out at least four or five over the next couple of weeks. I have, I already have the next four or five videos formulated in my brain. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna roll with it. I'm gonna do this one. And yeah, I have at least four or five more in addition to the one I'm doing today. So I guess a total of five or six that will be coming in the next few weeks. So I hope you join me and listen to me ramble about music that I love and movies that I love. I plan on doing a, a movie video or two. I, I, I should do more movie videos. I just don't. I feel like I have enough. I have way more records than I have movies. So I just feel like, well, I need to. I need to exercise those demons if you catch my drift. That's a bit of a hint as to what my next movie video will be, by the way. But yeah, I just, I have a lot more records than I have movies, so I have a lot more to say about the music. So anyway, I'm just rambling at this point. Let's get straight to it. This is a band that I've been listening to a lot lately. I don't know why. Sometimes I think I want, like, I'll, I'll, do you ever have those days where you wake up in the morning and you've got a song in your head and you haven't listened to the band recently? You haven't been thinking about them or that artist? As far as you know, nothing has prompted your brain to go down this avenue of listening to this group or even thinking about this artist, but you just wake up in the morning and you have a song in your head. You hear enough music in your life and that happens, at least to me. And that happened to me a couple of weeks with the, uh, ago with this group. And I've been listening to them off and on for the last two weeks. And it prompted me. I haven't, I haven't recorded this group's output. I have all of their records. And as I've mentioned in past videos, part of this channel is sort of the fruits and an illustration of what I do personally. Like I've been digitizing my record collection and, um, I haven't digitized this group's vinyl collection yet. I haven't done this yet. So when I was, when I got up a few weeks ago, I had one of their songs in mind and it just prompted me to go pull all of their records out and start digitizing them. And I thought, what a, what better time to start discussing the violent femmes. I, I absolutely love this band. I've loved them for many years. I think they're an interesting band to talk about because they've had different phases and they've been around for over 40 years now and they have a very dedicated and loving following and they have found a lot of mass popularity in recent years as well they should they have albums that are much better than others they are a group that's not really interested in repeating themselves so much and i really deeply respect that about them they have records that i don't love they have records that are some of my favorites. And today I'm just going to talk about my five favorites. Usually I avoid trying to discuss more than one album because my videos will go on forever. That's just too long, but this is going to be one of those long videos. Not, you know, something about my channel is that not everybody, hardly anybody actually watches my full videos. They, in fact, I'm going to pull up, this reminds me, there's something unrelated I wanted to share with you guys, but something, I check my analytics on my videos a lot. And something that I've noticed is the longer my videos are, the less people watch. Like people just don't watch. People do not watch. Where is, there it is. People don't watch my videos if they're long. You know, and I don't think people do that across the board in general when it comes to YouTube. If you're, 
In fact, YouTube recommends that you post videos that are no longer than 10 or 15 minutes because people have no attention span. They just move from one thing to the next. It's like that with everything these days. And YouTube's no different. I noticed that if I post a 10, or 10 to 15 minute long video, I'll get like 50% viewership. Like, you know, statistically, people will watch half of that video, which is a really good point to be at. You might think, oh, man, people are only watching half of my video, but that's actually good. In the world of YouTube statistical analysis, if people are watching your videos, 50% of your videos, that's really good. But the longer your videos are, the less people are watching. And so generally, if I have a video that's over a half an hour long, people only watch six or seven minutes of it. So if I post a 15 minute video, people watch seven minutes of it, which is good. If I, put, if I post a 40 minute video, people watch seven minutes of it, which is not good. So when they're determining like your monetization and how they want to advertise your stuff and in terms of what your your the money you make is, it's less because people are watching less of your videos and the advertisers know that. But then you have people like me who don't care about that. I don't really care about advertisers. So and by the way, this is what I wanted to share with you. I finally got I finally hit the hundred dollar threshold. As I've explained in past videos, YouTube doesn't send you any money as a YouTube creator if you don't get at least $100 in your cash float in your account. Well, I finally broke $100. So I'm getting my first payment from YouTube at the end of this month. It's supposed to be like $130 or something. So I'm finally getting my first money from this channel. After three and a half years, I'm finally getting some money. So thank you guys so much for watching and donating and I'm finally getting some money. <laughs> it's only 130 bucks, but hey man, that's, you know, for a lot of us, that's our, that's our gas for the month or that's our internet bill or that's our, you know, every little bit counts. I also wanted to, I know you guys tuned in for Violent Femmes here and I'll get to that in a minute. I know I'm getting sidetracked here, but that's what my channel is about. I tend to get sidetracked. I'm looking at my dashboard right now. I now have 1,083 subscribers, which seems like a lot to me. And I've had over 75,000 views since the beginning of my channel. That seems like a lot, right? Over 75,000 views. So that just means what it, what it says. I've had people click on my videos over 75,000 times. And my most my most watched video in the three and a half year lifespan of my channel is Skinny Puppy Rabies, and it's it's not even close, really. Um, yeah, Skinny Skinny Puppy Skinny Puppy Rabies. It is what it is. That is my most popular video, and I know you know I'm I'm acutely aware that. A lot of my subscribers are those industrial rivet heads or whatever. And I'm probably disappointing you guys by doing these types of videos, but sorry, man, I listen to all kinds of, all kinds of stuff. And I want to talk about all kinds of stuff. I didn't plan this, you know, like I had no idea skinny puppy rabies would get watched by anybody, much less over, let's see, over 10,000 times. I had no idea, no clue whatsoever. I just assume nobody will watch my videos at all. So, but for those of you who have tuned into my channel because of Skinny Puppy, thank you so much because, you know, I'm now officially starting to generate a little bit of revenue here. And, you know, I'm on the precipice of breaking 1,100 subscribers. So that's cool. It's funny too with my subscribers. I'll gain one and then, like, every week I'll gain five or six, but then I'll lose one or two. It's funny. Like for every three or four subscribers I get, I lose one. But I think a lot of those are spam. Like YouTube kind of clears their cache of spam accounts. And the more subscribers you have, the more bogus subscriberships you get. So I think I get a lot of spam accounts that have subscribed to me. Anyway, I've been rambling for almost 10 minutes now. Let's get to the Violent Femmes. I just wanted to give you guys kind of a small update. We are at the end of the year and... 
maybe I'll reiterate this in a, in a live stream or something if you guys are interested in doing that. I plan on doing like an end of year, my favorite albums of the year type video. So maybe I'll, you know, maybe I'll incorporate more analytics and statistical analysis into that video if you, if you want. If you don't care, then I, I won't do it. But I thought for those of you who are faithful to watching me and my channel, I thought you'd be interested in knowing that. So I want I want full disclosure with my channel. I want you to know what's going on financially and all that kind of stuff, because I feel like you deserve it. Anyway, Violent Femmes. Love this group. Now, admittedly, I don't know the Violent Femmes all that well past their fifth album. When Victor De Lorenzo left, I kind of lost interest. Like, and most of what I've heard since then is okay. I don't love everything they've done post Victor De Lorenzo. I, I think that Gordon Gano is a brilliant songwriter, and he's never really lost his talent for writing songs. But I love him as a songwriter, and I think that's why the Violent Femmes really are so beloved is that he's a he's kind of an odd mysterious songwriter like you listen to a lot of what he does and it's hard to pin down what he does um i think some people even get offended by gordon gano's songs they they think that everything he writes is autobiographical i've never looked at gordon gano like that as a songwriter i see him as like a, a classic sitting around the campfire type storyteller and that's why i love him you listen to his songs and i don't know how anyone could think he's autobiographical with his lyrics i mean of course he's not sometimes he is sometimes he's not and i think that's part of why people are so drawn to him that's the allure of the violent femmes is that there are a lot of different things all at once and some of it is undescribed you can't really put it into words you can't put your thumb on what exactly they do they're, they're punk, but they're folk, they're country, they're jazz. They're all kinds of shit. And that's why they're great. And Gordon Gano's weird, quirky songwriting is just a part of that. It's like, is he being autobiographical here? Maybe. I don't know. He clearly isn't being autobiographical here. But man, what if he was being autobiographical there? That's kind of scary. Like, his songs can be really creepy and weird and dark. But then... You know, he'll have these like quasi religious or not quasi just these these, you know, religious celebratory religious songs where you're like, wow, OK, so Gordon Gano, I don't think he's being ironic here. This is a guy that actually has a lot of faith. And as an atheist, which I am, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, some of my favorite music is religious music, honestly, because it's honest. That's really all I require from my music is honesty and it's if it's coming from a genuine place but the real religiosity in his music is there you know it's it's you, you can't avoid it but to me that's kind of cool like he goes from singing about how he, he can't get laid and how he wants to kill people to how he loves jesus and wants to be saved and and singing praises about his faith it's just it's his his music is about dichotomies to me. It, it's not just one thing. And that's what I love really ultimately about the Violent Femmes. They're very hard to put your finger on. And I think that's why a lot of people love them. It's, they're just, a, a, they are a band that exists in their own air. There's nobody that sounds like the Violent Femmes. Absolutely not. They are brilliant. Um, and it all, I think it all harkens back to Gordon Gano's songwriting. He is a fantastic songwriter. One of the greats, really, I think. And his band, like Brian Ritchie, you know, he's released his own solo albums. And his, his the way he plays his bass is so unique. He doesn't have the traditional bass. He's got an acoustic bass. So you always feel like this. I, I think at their heart, Violent Femmes is kind of a country band, really. But they've got that punk angle and the jazz angle and just the straight up eclecticism of their of their music. It's I, I hope I'm getting my point across. This band is hard to describe, and that's why I love them. They are just absolutely, completely and utterly unique. Violent Femmes. I love them. 
I will say that I don't know their output all that well after their fifth album. So I'm ranking their, I'm going to rank their, their top five albums according to me. Five. That's all I'm going to talk about. I think there are five albums that matter the most when it comes to the Violet Femmes, and those are the Victor De Lorenzo albums. Their first five, their original lineup. <clears throat> I have listened to their albums since then. I haven't felt the spark that the first five albums have. You know what I mean? Like there's a spark that that exists within the Violent Femmes. Those first five albums that, in my opinion, don't exist after those first five. I'm not saying I don't like their recent output. I think they've done some really cool stuff since their fifth album. But I'm ranking my favorite five today. Five. And that would be their first five. And I know people are going to disagree with this. I know there's one album in particular that most everyone just automatically assumes is their greatest album. I don't agree with that. Now, do I love it? Of course. I love all five of their first albums. I think they're all brilliant in their own way. But my favorite album is not what the majority of Violent Femmes fans' favorite album is. I think there's one generic album that everyone loves from the Violent Femmes because that's the one they know. They have one album, and I'll get to it, where it has a couple of tracks that everyone knows and you hear on the radio and you hear in commercials, and it's a great album. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not, but it is, it is not my favorite. So let's get to it. After almost 17 minutes of fanfare, let's get to the Violent Femmes albums. But I did want to say that I love this group. It's kind of a band I haven't listened to recently, but I woke up. A couple of weeks ago, and I had one of their tunes in my head, and I've been going through a Violent Femmes wormhole lately. So let's do this video, man. Let's do it. Now, this is my, I would put this number five, personally. This is what I consider to be their fifth best album. Still a very good album. This is a recent reissue. This is the one album of their first five that is a reissue. I never got the original vinyl press of this. It didn't come out in the United States then. And I was on a different vibe back then. I think I ended up getting the CD back then. I know this album backwards and front, but uh, this got re-released a couple years ago on Wax and I was happy to buy it because I didn't have it. This came out on Craft. I have a couple of things on Craft. Their presses are okay. I don't know. They're just typical modern reissue fare. Nothing fantastic, nothing amazing. It's okay. Decent stuff. This pressing's okay. I think this came out on different colored wax, like red, maybe clear. Mine's on black. I actually, I had an option to get red, clear, or black. I always get black if I have the option. Why do birds sing? This is a fantastic album. I'm ranking this number five. It doesn't mean I don't like it. I just think the other four are better. This album is the bridge album. This album was basically Violent Femmes kind of taking, up to this point, this was their first album in the 90s. Their first four were all in the 80s. This is their first album that came out in the 90s. And I think the album that came before this they, it was a, a bit of a departure from their classic sound. And I think a lot of fans bitched and moaned and complained about it at the time. That's the way I remember it, at least. And I was following these guys since the mid 80s when I was a kid. So I was there when this stuff was getting released. I remember that a lot of those classic Femmes fans had a problem with the album that came before this. Unfairly and unjustly so, by the way. Again, this is what I love about the Violent Femmes is their albums are all, they all kind of represent something different. That kind of just showcases their skill and their creativity. They're not really interested in giving people the same thing over and over. And I think they should be celebrated for that. This album is kind of taking the classic femme sound and marrying it to the new sound. Their new sound at the time. And more or less, I think the femmes still sound like this. I think that they never really changed the formula much after this. This album was the start of their modern sound, really, in a lot of ways. They took like classic songs that had existed for several years and they put them out here. And then they did some new stuff. And But Why Do Birds Sing? This came out in 1991. The big hit from this is American Music, of course. 
And I think a lot of people always thought American music was was supposed to be like a satire on American music. I never took it that way. I always thought that Gordon Gaynor was being heartfelt. He loves American music. This was a love letter to that. Like, I don't think there's any... I, Violent Femmes are definitely sarcastic and iron, I, ironic. Gaynor's music and lyrics have always been that way, but I don't think he was doing that on American music. I thought that was one of his heartfelt songs. I mean, again, this is what I love about the Femmes is you don't always know. Like, is he being ironic? I never thought he was. I thought that this was a heartfelt love letter to American music. This opening track. And yeah, everyone knows this. Everyone knows that song. It's a great song. It is absolutely one of their best. It should be popular. This for me is their fifth best because I feel like this is a tale of two sides, this album. Like the first side, side one is just kick ass. Every song, out the window, look like that. Culture clubs, do you really want to hurt me? Hey, Nani Nani, used to be. Just the, the first side is just hit after hit. Just rock solid. Nothing wrong with it. You flip it over and the B side is okay, in my opinion. I think it's good. Girl Trouble is one of their first songs that they ever did. They pulled it out to put on, put on this album. I don't think side two flows, though, as, as well as other Violent Femmes albums. It sounds like just kind of a mishmash, hodgepodge collection of old and new. That's not that's not a bad thing, but I think in comparison in comparison with the first side, I I just don't think it really flows perfectly like an album should. Still a good album. I still love this album, but for me, this is their fifth best. And I'll, let me show. This is a reissue. As far as I know, though, they, they reproduced it like the original issue did. Uh, the original issue looked like. Um, this came out, I think this only got released in Europe on vinyl at the time. This came out at a time where the U.S. market was just phasing out records. And here's the label. You get the craft label. This pressing is decent. It's fine. I wasn't overly impressed, but it wasn't so bad that it was distracting. It's got a nice kind of old school glossy inner. Not a lot of reissues do this anymore. This is how a lot of records existed back in the 80s and 70s. They had these glossy inners. They don't do that much anymore, but they did it here, and I like that. It's not exa exactly conducive to good vinyl care. If you pull the records in and out of a glossy sleeve over the years, it will scuff up the records a little bit, but it's only surface level. That's not a big deal. Decent pressing and a really good record. My least favorite of the first five of the five big Victor De Lorenzo era albums, but still an excellent, excellent record. My favorite, my favorite track, I mean, my favorite track would probably be either Out the Window or Used to Be. And Used to Be, to me, lyrically, it's got that classic Gordon Gano vibe, like those almost adolescent heartbreak songs that he would write. You know, Gaynor was so good about that. He, um, if you were ever feeling heartbreak and you, you were feeling lonely and you're feeling like it was you against the world and you had no shot, you ever thought you never would get a girlfriend again or whatever, like Violent Femmes is kind of the champion of that sound, right? Gordon Gaynor was great about that, that, that feeling of loss. You know, and used to be is the song on here that is like that. It's a song about loss. It's it's a song about feeling really, really down about yourself. And I think that's why the Violent Femmes have are always popular in with younger people. Like when you're young and you don't understand that you'll bounce back from this and you'll have a brighter future after getting dumped or something, you think it's the end of the fucking world. And Gaino is really good about encapsulating that feeling and used to be is that track on this album, I think. Why do birds sing? Very good album. Now, my number four choice, let me pull this out of here. I have a seven inch stuff in here. My number four choice is an album that is unfairly maligned, in my opinion. I think it's a very, very good album in its own right, it is The Blind Leading the Naked. 
I'm going to try to avoid talking about things you can bring up on Wikipedia. I always say this, but I don't want to talk about just general obvious shit. On this channel, I try to talk about deeper stuff. I will briefly mention that this was produced by Jerry Harrison of the Talking Heads. And this was their third album, released in 1986, right? Yeah, 86. This album, especially by Femmes fans, was very disliked because this is the one Violent Femmes album that doesn't sound like anything else they did. I mean, in my opinion, it does. This sounds like a Violent Femmes record in a lot of ways. They just had, it's a much bigger sound. You hear a lot of instrumentation. It's a big production. You hear horns. You hear all kinds of shit. Things that you normally wouldn't hear on a Violent Femmes album. It's just a very big, bombastic sounding album. Is that a bad thing? I don't think so. Because the core of what Violent Femmes is about is still here. This man's songwriting. The songs are still here. You can dislike the way it's delivered with its production and its big sound. That's fair enough. But the songs are still here. He hadn't lost his ability to write really compelling songs. That's why this album's good. I think those old school Violent Femmes fans always kind of diss this album. I think that's a mistake. This is a really good album. Now, does it have its moments of roughness? Yeah, it does. It's got some songs on here that are just kind of hard to listen to. But generally, I think this is a fantastic album. They brought in Jerry Harrison, from what I've read. They didn't really approve of that choice. From what I've heard, Harrison was based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and these guys are from Milwaukee, and the record label just thought, hey, you're both in Milwaukee. How about you produce this album? It's a ridiculous reason to choose someone to produce an album, but it is what it is, and they did it. I still think this is an excellent record. Love this record. Um, let me show. This is the inner. I don't know if they've reissued this. Have they reissued this? I don't know. I have no clue. I've had this record in my collection for years. In fact, I probably bought it new. In fact, this was around the time where I started becoming a Femmes fan. Because I was just a kid when this came out. But in fact, this might be the first record that came out new when I was actively being a fan. Came out on Slash, as you can see. You get the lyric. You get the lyrics on the inner sleeve. I don't know if this is hard to find. I, I, would, I would doubt that it is. This is their least popular album. Yeah, it's a very big sound. Lots of horns. Gano's got, a, you know, he's he gets really spiritual on this record. He, he does on every record. But I remember listening to, I think it's Faith, right? Faith. Listening to Faith, it, it's, I mean, it's just a, it's, it's just an unapologetic religious song. I got my faith, baby, and the Lord. Uh, you know, as someone who's never felt God, the presence of anything, religious in his life i remember listening to that song and maybe a half second i was like what is this but it didn't matter i don't care i like religious music if it's done well if it's produced and delivered well i don't care it's it's gordon gano's set of beliefs if he's compelling about it i don't care it doesn't matter to me i think people who turn themselves off to religious music who aren't religious are just being dumb and vice versa. I think religious people who won't listen to something that's godless are just as idiotic. Good music is good music. I don't care how it's delivered. And this is a great album, man. Um, I think my favorite probably, man, Cold Canyon, Cold Canyon. One of Gano's best songs. The people who like classic Violent Femmes and don't like this album, go listen to this again and listen to Cold Canyon, seriously. Or even Special. Special, Breaking Hearts, A Good Friend, Heartache. Come on. There's a lot of country going on with this record. It's even like Motown sounds, like songs like 
I held her in my arms. I mean, that's a big, a big sounding song. In fact, that's one of my least favorite Violent Femme songs, honestly. But the songwriting's still there. This guy's a great songwriter, man. There's no question about it. And when you when you've got that core of great songwriting, the rest of it kind of falls into place if you're just willing to let him take you there. And this band is super tight. Yeah, it's not produced in the way that we're used to, but when it comes to a Femmes album, still a great album. I would urge any old school Femmes fan to, to revisit this if you think you don't like this. Maybe it's been a long time since you've heard it. Revisit it. This is my number four choice. And I have a, oh, I remember why I have this. Yeah. Um, I have a seven inch. This is the um, Children of the Revolution seven inch. This was, that was the only single I think that got released from this album, but it's got a B side called World Without Mercy. And I think if I remember correctly, World Without Mercy was released on the cassette version. Somebody will correct me on this, but I don't think it was even on CD because, because back in the eighties, that's how record companies were enticing people to stop buying records. They were putting all these bonus tracks on the CD. But I think World Without Mercy was only put on the cassette. You only found it on the tape. A friend of mine had the tape. And I had the record, obviously, and he was playing it in his car one day. And I was like, what is this song, World Without Mercy? And he's like, I don't know. It was on the tape. And I thought, well, that sucks. I don't have this song. In my, in my searches over the years, I realized it's the B-side to the 7-inch of Children of the Revolution. But it's a really cool song. It's written by DiLorenzo. I, I assume that's why it didn't pop up on the album. I guess it doesn't really flow with the rest of the album, but it's a really good song in its own right. So I'm happy to have that 7-inch. I feel like it's a complete package with this song here. You need to have this all together. Blind Leading the Naked. I think it's a, a very underrated album. Now, I, I'm sure this is where... The controversy will start in terms of my list but this is my third favorite and this is what most everyone's favorite violent femmes album is is their first album and yeah this is my third favorite there are two other records of theirs that i think are better it's just an opinion okay stop your internal dialogue right now or your external dialogue you're having with me right now i don't care this is a brilliant album i'm not saying it's not but this is, I don't think this is their best album. I think this is the album that everyone knows. All right. This is the album that everyone knows about. And so therefore it's their best album. It has blister on the sun on it. It has added up on it. It has, um, you know, what's, what's the other one? Uh, gone daddy gone. It's got gone daddy gone on it. Those are the songs that everyone knows. And so this is their favorite album. But in my opinion, this is not their best album. This is their first album. Was this 82 or 83? No, I don't know. It doesn't even say on here. Come on, really? Um, I want to say it's 83. but No, it's 82. Wow. Over 40 years. Oh, that reminds me, too. When I was pulling all these out, I, um, I was digging around for Violent Femmes. Um, I was just looking at what they've released recently because I haven't really been paying attention to them. And I, I noticed that they're re-releasing this album. Was it next month, two months from now? They're doing like a big, like a box set for this, like a three album or four album set of like demos. And um, I look forward to picking that up. I pre-ordered it because that is something I definitely would like to get. I think it's on the craft label, the same label that put out that reissue of White A Bird Sing that I showed earlier. But this is their most beloved album, and I, I, I can tell why, you know. It's it's hit after hit, Blister in the Sun, Kiss Off. That's the other song people know. Please Do Not Go. Fantastic record. This is brilliant. There's really not a bad moment on here. And it really showcases why people love this group. It's got folk. It's got country. It's got pop. It's got jazz. It's got experimental. Like, songs like... Um, to the Kill. I mean, what a weird song that is. When I hear songs like that, I think of like 
you hear tempo changes and it almost reminds me of Thelonious Monk or something. I think these guys had to be listening to like avant-garde jazz and shit, you would think. In fact, I, I think they were. If you listen to Brian Ritchie's solo albums, he did he did a cover of Nuclear War, which is a Sun Ra track. And, uh, you know, you, you hear those influences on the Violent Films records, too. And this record has all of it. This is their most po popular album. And I can see why. I really don't have any anything bad to say other than that. The one thing I think over time that I think ages this album a little bit, and this is why it's at number three for me, is that it's, it's, um, I think this is a very adolescent album, and I'm not saying that in a derogatory way. This album was really popular in high school, when I was in high school. This is an album about, this is a great album for kids. <laughs> it's, it's an album about not understanding the opposite sex about thinking it's the end of the world when you lose somebody like like add it up i mean add it up is a song about gordon gano's pussy woes you know why can't i get can't, why can't i get just one fuck and that's why that song was so popular at least in the area that i live in in the world that was the that was the big hit on this album actually it wasn't blister in the sun it was added up because you hear the word fuck in it that was the sole reason why people loved this song and this album. Have you heard Add It Up? He says, fuck. You know, when you're a kid, especially back in the 80s, that was a big revelation. You know, it's a song and an album about, you know, a boy not being able to get the attention of the girl he wants. And so that's why this is like, in my opinion, this is one of the best album for adolescents and young adults that's that has ever been made but that's also what dates it a little bit as you get older you hear those songs and you love them because you experienced them when you were you were an adolescent but as an adult it, you know that doesn't necessarily age all that well at least for me that's my take great album i have really nothing negative to say that is my only minor criticism this is an album full, chock full of great songs, man. And I, God, I've had this, I mean, I think I bought this, I've had this forever. And I don't know, I, I'm assuming this has been reissued many, many times. I don't know. I have no clue which version I have. Here are my labels. I remember buying this back in the mid 80s. I mean, it's at least that old. I don't know. I bought it used. You know, a lot of these records from the early 80s, especially, are records that I bought used. But, you know, you could buy used records in ex excellent shape for two or three bucks back then. In fact, that's probably what I paid for this. I don't know if this is the original. This is the U.S. issue, by the way. I don't know if it's the original press. Maybe it is. Someone could tell me if it is or not. Great album. Fantastic record. I think this album will, will forever live to be one of the great, great rock, general, general rock albums that has ever existed. And I totally understand its popularity. It is fantastic, and I love this record. It is my third favorite, personally. That's not a bad thing. Still love what's going on with this record. Always will. Now... These are, the, these are the two big heavyweights when it comes to Violent Femmes, and this is my second favorite. And obviously, if you're a Violent Femmes fan, and you know I'm only talking about the first five, you're going to know what my number one is. But this is my second favorite. Hollow Ground. This, just, this came out after the first album. The self-titled. By the way, this is just self-titled. There was no title to this. This is Hollow Ground. Now, this was just a collection of songs that, that existed when this came out. All of these songs existed at the same time. I remember seeing an interview with Richie at some point over the years where they made the conscious decision to put their more poppy songs all on the first album and then put their deeper, darker tracks here. And, man, it works. This is a... Oh, I love this record. 
In my opinion, and the song that was on my head that made me start thinking about these guys recently is Country Death Song, the first song on here. Country Death Song is the best Violent Femmes song that has ever existed for me. It is a, a tale of total darkness and despair. And I think Country Death Song is one of those examples, I think, of why Violent Femmes are so popular. People don't know what to do with that song. It's a really spooky, creepy song. Vi Gordon Gano is singing about shoving his daughter in the well and hanging himself. And I mean, it's a really dark fucking song. And it's brilliant. Obviously, it's not autobiographical. I think this is what's so fun about this group is like, Gano is telling a tale. Gathered around the campfire. Let's. I got a story I want you guys to hear. Love that shit. Love it. It's a fairy tale. But he's also, you know, Gano's a religious guy. I assume he reads the Bible and he believes in heaven and hell. And Country Death Song is a song about hell. It's a dark song and it's beautiful. Love this track and I love this album. It's a very religious album too. I mean, um, Jesus Walking on the Water, which is one of their best songs, I think. As I mentioned before, I'm not religious at all. I love Jesus Walking on the Water. I hear that song, and it's, I, I get pumped up. I get jacked up. That song is so cool. Um, Hollowed Ground. I think Side 2 is better than Side 1 on this album. Sorry, you can't really see the print. It's really dark. But uh, my favorite, obviously, is Country Death song, Black Girls. Again, another song where Gaynor is just being out and out honest about his preference, his preferences of, of pussy. Maybe it's autobiographical. Maybe it's not. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Black Girls is a fantastic song. And it, I think it was definitely a precursor to The Blind Leading the Naked. You hear a lot of uh, horns on that. Lots of live instrumentation. Black Girls could have easily been on The Blind Leading the Naked, I think. It's got a very similar sound to it. And then uh, the, the last song, It's Gonna Rain. And again, another very kind of religious, spiritual type feel on that. You're getting all kinds of vibes here, and it all works. Same producer, I think his name was Mark Van something. Mark Van Hecke, right. Same dude produced the first album. So this, the sound is very similar to the first album, but it's just darker, much darker. The first album's dark too. But this is just a different type of dark. My second favorite Violent Femmes album. I think this is a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. Um, not much to see on the labels here. Another Slash release. Pretty much like it looks exactly like that first album, labels-wise. I don't know if they've reissued this, have they? You guys can tell me. Boring, a boring... Uh, Polly inner sleeve on this one, no lyrics or anything. It was always like that too, as far as I know. No lyrics, just kind of a stark release for a very stark sounding album. It, it doesn't always sound stark, but it's. I think if you think of stark, if you were to pick one Violent Femmes album that is stark, it's this, and I think that only serves it well, beautifully well. This is a awesome record. I've listened to this record, I can't even count how many times. This is a beautiful piece of work and absolutely essential if you have this. If you if you know this album and you don't know this album, you're doing yourself a disservice. These two are hand in hand. You need to these two go together. Like milk and cereal. You need to have these two albums together. Especially this. Beautiful record. Love Hollow Ground. One of my favorites. Now, obviously, my favorite. Violent Femmes album, and I know people will disagree with this. I don't care. I really don't care. If I could pull this out of here, it would be nice. Three. This is my favorite Violent Femmes album. I think, for the very simple reason, this man's songwriting has, was never better than what you find on this album, Three. This was their fourth album. I assume that Three meant these three dudes. That's what this is representing. I think after... The Blind Leading the Naked, I think what they're saying here is like, we're back to the core of what the Violent Femmes are about, us three guys. Blind Leading the Naked, I think fans were pissed off because it had this big sound. 
had this big outside producer. It didn't sound like them. And so I think that's what their statement was here. I could be wrong on that, but that's how I always took it. We're back and we're doing what we want to do now. This to me is just their best, their best work. And Gordon Gano's greatest songwriting. A lot of people disagree with this. A lot of people accuse this record of being too, <clears throat> being too um, country or being too easy listening or whatever. I don't agree with any of that. I think this has some of their deepest, darkest, most intense moments they ever did. And it has, I think if, if any Violent Femmes album has the greatest bulk number of awesome Gordon Gano pen tracks, it's three. His songwriting on this album is just stellar. There's not a bad moment on this album. Beautifully written, beautifully conceptualized and written, beautifully produced and delivered. Here's the inner sleeve. Love this album. Absolutely love this record. Gordon Gano was just absolutely on top of his game. He's never been better as a songwriter. Here it Here's the label, the very the very boring slash label, as you see on every one of these records at the time. I won't hammer that more than I need to. Um, the sound on this, it does have some horns, but this is a very quiet, introspective affair of this album. There are some hard rocking tunes on this, though. People seem to forget that. It, the, the overall mood on this album is very somber, very very dark in fact i'd argue their darkest that track is on here nothing worth living for which is a brilliant song by the way holy shit what a what a song but this is a gorgeous album fems fans i don't care if you disagree with me i'm a fems fan too and this is their greatest work if you ask me if someone were to say point me to the best fems album i would say three every time start with three I'm not denigrating any of their other albums that I've talked about. I, this is just my favorite. It's hard to pick a favorite song on here, man. I mean, Nothing Worth Living For is, is just insane. Dating Days, World We're Living In, Outside the Palace. Outside the Palace. Other than Country Death Song, I don't think Gordon Gano has written a better song. Outside the Palace, a beautiful piece of work. Unbelievably good. Outside the Palace is a song I've always taken as Gordon Gano kind of looking back at his life and growing up. It was his step toward being an adult. A gorgeous song. If you haven't heard Outside the Palace, go listen to it. I there there There's no number of times that is enough for me to hear Outside the Palace. That song always warms my heart. Absolutely one of his greatest songs. Arguably his best, Outside the Palace. I'd love to hear what you guys think of that song, too, because, yeah, uh, what a song. I mean, when I when I think about it, maybe that's my favorite song. Country Death Song's a hard song to beat, but Outside the Palace, I think, is his most underrated song. Just a beautiful, brilliant song. Nightmares, that was the single from the album, Just Like My Father. What a great song. Just like my father, but I am much worse. Dating Days, really funny. Fat, another really funny song. Fool in the Full Moon, that's the, like the hard rocking song on here. It's not like hard rocking in a punk way. It's more hard rocking like in a bluesy way. But it's good. I don't normally love blues music either, but Fool in the Full Moon works. Nothing worth living for. Man, what a dark song that is. If you're feeling low and you just want you just want a song to kind of reflect your depression, the low that you've sunk to, full uh, world, sorry, nothing worth living for. I'm forgetting the song title, nothing worth living for is absolutely way up there. That is a song where you you need to be in the right frame of mind to be able to handle that song. It's really dark, really gloomy, and beautiful for it. World We're Living In is another great song. Um, I feel like that was a song written about AIDS. I could be wrong about that, but um, that was Gordon Gano just recognizing what a fucked up world we live in. And he's always done that. 
the world we're living in is just one of the great examples of him being able to verbalize it in a song outside the palace telephone book mother of a girl that's a great song awesome lyrics you look what, what does he say you look like you could be the mother of a girl a girl i hated more than any other girl in the world and then he go you look like uh the mother of a boy i want i wanted to permanently pound his prick into the dirt i mean just awesome lyrics man this guy gordon gano he goes from like these deeply spiritual religious songs to pounding some dude's prick into the dirt Honestly, I think that's why people love the Violet Femmes is he he sings from a real place. Like he'll sing these tunes of spirituality, which are not autobiographical, but then he'll sing a song like Mother of a Girl, which seems to be autobiographical, but maybe not. It's he keeps you guessing. I think that's the greatest music. Songs that kind of keep you off kilter, off balance, keep you on your toes. Few writers are better than at doing that than Gordon Gano. This is Violet Femme's greatest work, in my opinion. Three. If you're just starting with this band, I would say you start here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first album is what it is. I know. It's got Blister in the Sun. I know. Okay. How many more times do you need to hear Blister in the Sun? Have you not heard that song enough? I mean, it's been fucking commercials at this point. I remember there they had a huge row actually Richie and Gano. I don't know 10 or 15 years ago it popped up in a Wendy's commercial and Richie got super pissed off at him. Obviously they reconciled but I think they didn't talk to each other for a while. In fact I think Richie sued him. I remember this is what I remember. Blister and the Sun ended up in a Wendy's commercial and um yeah it causes a pro it caused a problem with Richie and Gano. They're obviously okay now. They're still together and performing and doing these things. But um, personally, when I hear Blister in the Sun, I turn it off. It's enough with that song. It's kind of like Smells Like Teen Spirit. I think it's a good song that's been soured. Overplay. How many times can you hear a song in your life, you know, before you get annoyed with it? You want to hear a song when you're ready to hear it. You don't want something force-fed down your throat over and over. And I feel like that's what Blister in the Sun is. That's probably soured my take on that first album a little bit. I feel like it's it's enough with that album. This is where all of their hidden gems are. Three. And I thought I'd show this too. I pulled this out of my Violent Femmes archives. This is just like a, this is a promo interview disc actually for three, three on three. Slash put this out at the time. It's basically like, you know, an hour long interview with the band at the time. It's pretty, I think it's an, yeah, like this side is 28 minutes and then this side is 28 minutes. So yeah, you get 56 minutes of interview. Basically it's like them talking about the, the album and then they intersperse the songs in, in with the album music. Anyway, this was there. I thought I'd show it, but for me personally, this is their greatest work followed closely by Hollow Ground, followed very closely by their first album, and then probably trailed significantly by The Blind Leading the Naked. I think the big three are those three I just showed, and then these last two are very excellent albums, but nowhere near the brilliance as those first albums, first three. Still a good album. And why the birds sing? Some fantastic stuff on here. So that is my Violent Femmes video. I hope you enjoyed it. I love this group. I have briefly listened to their output uh, since Why the Birds Sing, but you know, I just I don't know. The, these guys during the '80s, they th that was their time. That was their time to shine. I think. They were still kind of dazzling us with this new sound and they still do, but never more so than the eighties. And I think three is the perfect illustration of how great this band can be. I think this is the last time that this band truly, truly was shining and firing on all cylinders and you will never hear better songwriting 
than what you hear on here. Open your mind up a little bit. I know you guys are, most Violent Femmes fans are obsessed with that first album, and it's a great album. But I look forward to that day when you open up your mind a little bit and, and let this album into your heart, because this is brilliant. Their best work. All right. I will talk to you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye.